So here we are standing in front um, of a vehicle that uh, in fact is original, uh, yes. made during the war and uh, not the uh, post-war G13. But uh, there are a lot of details and components and also the story behind this that is quite interesting. Yes. So what's your opinion? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the origin of this particular vehicle was uh, Following the bombing of Alket in Berlin in 1943, they were desperately looking for alternative production for uh, facilities for Sturmgeschütz. But when they looked at the facilities in uh, BMM in Prague, the factory was not capable of producing Sturmgeschütz because it didn't have the right size uh, buildings, cranes and all the, all the things that go with it. So a new design was uh, initiated and very quickly they came up with this design here which is based on the Jagdpanzer IV which was in effect the new version of the Sturmgeschütz where the gun mantlet was like this, a ball mounting, a Pac-39 anti-tank gun. Um, but they wanted now to put this into a 38T chassis or to use as many of the existing well tried and tested components of a 38T. So although it looks like a 38T, it definitely is not a real 38T. The, dry, the uh, gearbox, the transmission, the engine, that's all coming straight from the 38T family. But even when we look at the, the wheels here, this suspension has been strengthened and increased in size quite dramatically. And what you can see here in, in the Swedish Museum is the interim between the uh, 38T wheels and the final uh, version of the Jagdpanzer 38 wheels. So the ro row of bolts here and this wide rim, this is applying to the original discs of the 38T this extra wide rim to make the, the, the tire much larger and give a longer wheelbase and a better support for the heavy gun that goes in. This is really designed as a well-armoured anti-tank gun. It only has 20 millimeter on the side, but compare that to the Marder that we looked at earlier on, where you have a very thin side armour. The crew are much better protected. And the front here is a 60 millimeter uh, plate, which in comparison to what was on the uh, self-propelled gun, like a Marder, is tremendous. But this is not as expensive and uh, high quality armour as you've got normally with the tanks or the Sturmgeschütz. Um, but they could be produced in fairly significant numbers and were obviously quite uh, um, appreciated by the troops that were then using them as uh, self-propelled anti-tank guns. The, the name Hetzer, which has become synonymous with this, is actually uh, nowhere to be found in official documentation. Uh, it appears to be a nickname that some of the, some of the troops used because at a conference uh, in November of 44, Guderian was asked to come back and report as to where these strange names were coming from. And to come back to who? to Hitler, okay. saying where is this coming from and some of the names he could justify because they were coming from industry or uh, ministries but in the case of the Jagdpanzer 38 there was no explanation except some troops were using that name. Where they got it nobody seems to know. So the correct name is Jagdpanzer 38. Uh, I think nowadays uh, there's a lot of confusion with the Swiss G13 because after the war Skoda who had joined the production uh, of these Jagdpanzer 38s still had a tremendous number of components and by components I mean armoured bodies that had been manufactured either by themselves or by another party were sitting in their yard and many of the, uh, the mechanical and uh, components were still available and the Swiss were looking for a, a possible source of supply for equipment um, and eventually Skoda wrote a contract with the Swiss to supply these on, under their uh, code name of G13. But there are some fairly significant differences between a Jagdpanzer 38 and a G13. 
the most important is actually that the gun on a G13 is actually a, um, a STUK 40, which is the gun from the Sturmgeschütz, because Skoda was the largest manufacturer of those guns, so they had the capability of remanufacturing uh, the Stuke 40s, whereas this gun in the German Jagdpanzer 38 is a um, Pack 39, which was only manufactured by a German company had, which had gone out of business. Okay. So in 1947, they, they were involved in the sales campaign and they were then supplied over 160 of these vehicles to Switzerland from the late 40s through into the early 50s. And you'll see there's a change in the wheels on a G13. The, the Sturmgeschütz gun is in there, which is completely different. The traverse mechanism, all of the mechanicals associated with the gun are quite different. But lots of people have got them. They take a quick look at the nice black and white photographs from the, the war period and they look at the vehicle. It looks like uh, the same thing and they then paint crosses and so forth. But if you want to see a genuine one, come here and have a look at it. The other thing that's very unusual, there's only one more that I know of in the world and that's this heavy gun mantlet, which was the first gun mantlet that was introduced on the earlier versions of these. Um, later on they made a, a slightly less complex and less heavy one because all the time they were trying to reduce the, the, the weight on the, on the front wheels here. But it was a very effective gun when it was handed out to the uh, Panzerjäger people who were the anti-tank troops. They were very happy with it. So then this, since it looks very much like the 38, uh, it's a bit wider, it's a bit longer, and it's a bit higher. Bigger diameter wheels. Yes. Everything is, is getting bigger and bigger because they had to do that to carry the big gun uh, effectively. If you just had a 38 chassis, well, yes, you could put an anti-tank gun on top of it, but you couldn't encase it in a decent protection. So that is quite interesting to, to when you look at pictures from, from the wartime and you don't see the diameter and it's impossible to, to compare. Yeah. You need to, since when we did this one, we managed to define, well, that looks a bit strange. So I actually measured and there are different sizes yes. and I measured more and more and more and realized it's not the same chassis. Yeah. It differs. Well, it's interesting also on the, on the Jagdpanzer 38, they have uh, inclined armor for the side of the hull. Yes. Um, and here in the museum, we can compare this to the Landsberg M38 tanks. That's what they had as well. So it wasn't a brand new feature. It was, it was something that had already been tried out. Um, one thing that I've seen and, and people asking about is the limited visibility from, from this vehicle. Well, what can you say about that? It's an anti-tank gun. Yeah, but you need to, to, look, <laughs> to look out uh, anyway. It's not, it's not meant to be charging around like a tank, with, which needs lots of good visibility to see what's around. The, the concept of using these was that they, the uh, company commander should make sure the reconnaissance is done, that the area it's going to be involved in defending is well uh, assessed. And then these basically wait and lie in wait for something to come to them rather than the other way around. So you can depend on a little bit less vis visibility. Having said that, certainly in uh, BMM, towards the end of the war, they were experimenting with uh, different uh, and improved visibility. On, on the commander was due to get a rotating periscope um, on his compartment, which would have certainly been better than a straight ahead periscope. Mm -hmm. um, as we can see on, on this vehicle, the, the front headlight is wrong. It should be an Altec light there. Yes. So that, that's done in, in, in Sweden and also the periscope up there on the roof, it's not original. Uh, in that hole should be something else. Oh uh, yes, that's and, and we, the, we're not sure why they put this periscope in there in the former uh, uh, tank museum, but they did. So what should be in that hole? Well, I mean, that's, that's a uh, periscope from a Swedish uh, 
LT38 yes, in effect. So that's the same as you would get on normal LT38. It, it could be that when they looked at whatever was remaining of this, that this is there was actually a periscope in there, but this was the periscope that came up and was inside the remote control machine gun. And the remote control machine gun with its two shields around it was sitting there and uh, you, you placed a magazine for 50 rounds on top and you could fire that from completely operating like a periscope on a submarine for an inside. So you had a gun sight with a, uh, from a periscopic point of view underneath that. So it may be that that's why they chose to put something like that in there. But it would be nice to have the uh, remote controlled machine gun back in, but it's a very complex uh, device. I don't know that there's any of them around anymore. From, from the beginning when, when the vehicle came to Sweden in 1945, we have seen pictures of it and it had this bracket on top there. But yes. I guess that that was probably in the way for the, the use of the vehicle. So they just throw it off. Yeah. Uh, so it disappeared. But it's interesting with this kind of remote controlled machine gun application done in 1944, the same idea where you have on almost any vehicle today, they have a remote controlled gun mount on top of the vehicle instead of keeping the head out and, and exposing yourself. Yeah, well, the, the, the remote control machine gun was mounted there, but it was al already initiated on the Strungschutz first and then modified to go on this one. So the two kind of then went hand in hand and it did give them a, uh, an ability to protect themselves from inside the vehicle uh, without having to get out and mm. uh, get involved in a hand Things fight. get back again 50, 60 years later, but in a different yep. configuration. Uh, the visibility of, of this particular vehicle was pretty poor when they used it in, in Sweden. So they cut a hole um, at the front for the, the driver to be have a better, yes, better yes. view, but that has been welded shut. So we're, there's a, a thin plate uh, in there to, to make it look correct. Well, for, for people that are interested in the vehicles from a modeling point of view or anything else, the other thing that's interesting then is that this still has the, the um, cast cover for the periscope, whereas the, the Alponsa 38, say in Bovington, or in uh, the in the American uh, museums, that has a, a different arrangement where just the periscopes stick out through holes in the plate, and they just have a rain cover over them. But this is a protected. Uh, so that's uh, another evidence of that. This is a quite early. Oh, it's an earlier, early vehicle. production yes, yes, and one of yes. the first ever made. Yeah, yeah. They, they, I mean there is. You can see that damage has occurred because here um, new towing uh, no, uh, eyes have been added to the front because the, the original ones have been snapped off and that was a common problem with these earlier ones. It was later that they, they modified them uh, and put in this strengthening and so forth because it's relatively soft plate and if, um, if somebody tries to tow the vehicle slightly crooked or they jerk it suddenly, the plate will snap. Mm. And that, that they, they knew when they built the G13, they, they already had that strength. And That's right, they've already got, well, they've got two strengthening plates. They've, one is this, the horizontal uh, strengthening across, but they also have an extra side plate on to make sure that it doesn't crack. Yeah. Um... And then, of course, the, the, all along, they were hoping that this Jagdpanzer 38 would be able to be fitted with a rigid mounted gun. So the German designation for that was a STAR, uh, S-T-A or R, a rigid mounted gun. So instead of the gun recoiling, you, it was locked in position and the vehicle suspension would absorb the recoil. Oh, okay. yeah. um, the advantage of that is you, you save a huge amount of space in t internally. Um, now there was about 10 of these built in the end, they were tested for a long period of time, but originally they were hoping that they would go into production with that, but they never really did. There was just a few uh, that you were used, and they were used, you could say, in action when the Czechs took over after the German uh, surrender. 
and, and, and many, many of the museums and collections all over, over the world, when, when I look at pictures and, and films, I can identify a few things that actually tells this is not an original, it's a G13. Yeah. And we have a sort of a small club on Facebook chasing who can trace the fake, <laughs> the fake ones. Uh, but it's interesting to, to, to look in, and on many of these guns on those Hetzers, yeah. there is a thread at, at the end of the barrel. Yes. Uh, and that has that is something that you, you see on these vehicles, but there should be a muscle brake sitting there. Yes. So that is the evidence for that. It's not the original. Well, this, again, this, this has kind to of, 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 uh, of gun, so they have undone the, the muscle brake. One has to remember that the Swiss vehicles always have a Sturm Cannon 40. It's a different gun, yes. completely different recoil system. And that was one of the features, obviously, of a Sturmgeschütz gun was to have the muzzle brake on it. But for this, they all, right from the beginning, they were intending not to bother with the, uh, the muzzle brake. They were using part of the vehicle to absorb the, the recoil. So in, in case of, of disguising a G13 to look more like a head, so there are certain things that you have to do to look it, yeah, make, make it look a bit more uh, original. There's, the, the, the exterior has only got a few small things on it that give it away. The big giveaway is you open the hatch, you look in, and straight away you see there's no traverse like in a German vehicle. It's, it's a totally different mechanism that they had to introduce for the uh, Stug K40. Um, interesting vehicle. Mm, absolutely. Good.